Hi, I'm Matthias, and this is actually an episode about learning, about research, and about why I'm not yet making an episode about this, apparently the root of what we would call the final generation of military revolvers, the Fanyu. For the sake of tradition though, let's go ahead and shove it in the light box. This is normally the part where I'd read out a bunch of these little data points, but again, we're not actually ready to do the Fanyu episode. A great number of facts around this gun have proven to be, well, very elusive. If you haven't figured it out yet, this is going to be a special episode. A weird one at that. There's going to be no shooting. Uh, there's going to be no May conversation at the end, sadly. My apologies. No, this is an episode about the seemingly bottomless pit of unending self-doubt that research brings to the human soul. You see, this particular firearm has become the single biggest hole to ever be blown into the CN Arsenal ship. We've done our best to go back and clean up episodes that got it wrong as soon as we find out what is right, usually with the Primer series. For those of you familiar with history, you know that as evidence turns up, stories can change, sometimes significantly. Even now, there are actually a number of Primer episodes that could technically be reworked. Some of these are simply early episodes that suffered from our inexperience and extremely high initial production times as we learned what we were doing. Some have been materially changed by new information that has come to light. Honestly, all the episodes featuring early stories of John Moses Browning need some touch-up thanks to a new biography that's been released. Some episodes just weren't as good as they could be, and yet getting organized to tackle them again has proven very difficult. And finally, some could have been better but I just didn't bumble into the right information before we filmed with what we knew at the time. Now that last point has actually proven to be true for literally every Revolver episode of this show. But that's for a good reason, which is that literally no one on the planet Earth apparently knows for sure how to talk properly about Revolvers. At least, no one I have yet to find. For many years, people have pointed me to Taylorson's three-volume set. However, despite his very wide observations and documentation of many actions and features, Taylorson's books do little to shine light on the evolution of various lockworks. As a matter of fact, he actually suffers from a problem I've found over and over again, a reliance on just one or two archives, which create assumptions about what must be downstream versus upstream. In Taylorson's case, he largely references the US and British patent records, which are excellent resources, and yet in the world of revolvers, they're woefully incomplete. That's because modern revolvers were largely developed in Belgium by the Liège gunsmiths. I'm not saying exclusively, mind you, but the influence is huge. Now, if you try to find easy reading focused on wheel guns before 1865, you're really only going to see more specialized volumes, perhaps starting with Samuel Colt himself. But there will also be documents as wide as, say, the guns of the Civil War. However, these are usually American-centric, or in some cases, you might find them focused on, say, British patents, or very rarely, French. This approach would be an obvious one for English-speaking researchers, the US and British patents that is, and of course, uh, for a show like ours that is English, we're going to see a lot of them too. Working from these sources, I soon began to realize I had a problem. Revolver actions were being largely broken down into various lockwork types. Popular references to these types include the Shamlo Delvin, the Nagal, the Galand, the Adams, and if they were being fancy, they might mention something like the Beaumont. My realization, however, was that these were generally applied incorrectly. There's a great many times that I would see a gun that was claimed to be a descended from the Nagan. It had no features of the Nagan, or vice versa. Once I began to see that there was a problem, I attempted to correct myself. I read whatever I could find to try and get it sorted correctly. However, everything I read was frankly a complete mess of the same problems, just pointed back and forth in different directions. Misattribution of action types and features to various downstream designs. You can see me struggling with this fact uh, in the first version of our Bodeo episode. Here, I marveled at the extremely simple lockwork, but had no idea who had actually created it. It wouldn't be until later that I found out that it was a copy of Jean Warnant's sublime design. Now, the Warnant realization had come from a thankfully thoughtful two-volume set by Rolf H. Mueller. 
Wonderfully, these are the widest reaching books I know of in existence on European revolver designs. Thanks to Mueller, I was able to start putting some names to the various lockworks that we had seen on the show. And yet, I still noticed some inconsistencies. And this is actually where it gets a bit hard to follow for a lot of you guys at home, and that's for two big reasons. One, the material is a bit nuanced, and two, the terminology has actually never been truly settled, not on the global stage, let alone even a national stage for anyone, it seems. In digging through all these histories, and especially patents, I have discovered that there is almost no consensus on what to call various revolver parts. Ideally, we'd just go with the first terms used for a certain component by the first person to name it in a patent. However, that becomes very messy when generic structural names are used for just about everything, including other parts in the same lockwork. Let's look at the simplified Shamlo Delveen lockwork just to have an example of how this gets confused. The trigger and the hammer are fairly obvious to everyone watching this show. This is the sear used in single action and as a rebound position for the hammer. This, well, to some it is the hand, to others it might be called a pawl. In the US, Smith & Wesson and Colt each chose one of those two terms and led us into having two distinct names for it in the American uh, venue. It's led to a lot of confusion, especially because this part here could also be called a pawl and has been. Smith & Wesson, who copied this design for their first double actions, would actually call it the front seer. I've basically been calling it a strut, but that's actually a poor term in some ways. It might be better called a dog or even a clutch. Frankly, I haven't decided what's best and I'm open to suggestions before I declare we've solved the problem. There are so many common revolver parts that need to be squarely named, but that's a thesis for another day. Now with Mueller's help, I was able to at least correctly ID the father of the Bodeo lockwork. That's where we left off in the story a second ago. Again, this was Jean Warnett who came up with an astoundingly simple, automatically rebounding hammer lockwork patented in November of 1875 in Belgium. Now, if you saw our Swiss 1878 episode, you'll know that Warnett was the primary designer of that particular pistol with some input from Rudolf Schmidt. It was, supposedly, according to Mueller and trusted others, Schmidt who modified the Warnett lockwork to use both a hammer spur, a more traditional feature, and a separate uh, arm in front of that rebounding spring operation. This would further evolve, thanks to Schmidt, into the Model 1882 lockwork. Here we had a hammer nose, separate rebounding arm, and trigger spur, all different from the original Warnett system, all supposedly added by Schmidt. Now Schmidt hadn't been the inventor of the hammer nose, I knew that for sure, and in walking that feature back, plus reviewing some Belgian patents, I started to find something a little bit odd. Ultimately, it all came to a head when I bumbled into this particular pistol, which I was having a hard time pinning down to a particular date of invention. From reference material, I knew the Fania was an early 1870s design, which would obviously predate the late 1870s Swiss 1878 and early 1880s Swiss 1882. And yet, that Fanyu had that unique combination of separate rebounding arm and the use of the hammer nose. Well, I guess we found Schmidt's inspiration. Good, that's what I was looking for. Since I still didn't have a hard date though, all of this confusion on who did what and when they did it has been on my mind for quite a while. So much so that I reached out to a good friend of mine who happened to be Belgium adjacent and offered my buddy Lars the funding to dig the Belgian patent archives in an attempt to sort out some of this mess. Unfortunately, we had a major world event uh, that occurred and the matter went on hold for two whole years. With things finally thawing out, he has managed to get over and do the work just in time to actually ruin a very recent episode on those Swiss revolvers <laughs> by finding this, an 1874 patent by Alexandre Fanu. Yep, that is definitely the lockwork that I was so curious about and that we saw in the Swiss in so, so very many other revolvers. I want to stress very carefully how important this little lockwork is as a matter of fact. 
Starting with the Fanu Maguire, a popular French officer's private purchase, a list of Fanu lockwork Marshall revolvers includes, but is not at all limited to, the Danish 1880, the Swiss 1882, the British Webley marks one through six, the Dutch 1891, the Danish 1891, the French 1892, the Japanese Type 26, the Austrian Rostengasser 1898, the US Colt New Service, and the following Army Special, of course. Plus, it's Spanish-made clones, the Spanish Smith & Wesson clone, and the Spanish Bayard clone. Actually, the Fanyu lockwork remains standard for Colt, so all those beloved snake guns that you guys collect? Uh, yeah, just a Fanyu with a hammer block added in. So, having bumbled into the origins of the modern revolver, I was feeling a little proud of myself, right? I had just really discovered uh, Mueller's little timeline tucked in the back of his second volume, and I had already found a gap that he had missed that explained a lot. Now, to Mueller's credit, he was very specific about his taxonomy. He considered all the aforementioned guns to be modifications of the Warnant, usually calling them Warnant Mariettes. This was in order to explain how a hammer nose ended up being added into the otherwise very plain Warnant patent lockwork, at least to his eyes. Because apparently he had not found the Fanyu, which predated Warnant's work anyway. Now that name, Mariette, that got me digging into the precursors of the Fanyu patent, and this is where two observations by Mueller really seem to fit the bill. He declares that Giles Mariette was the originator of the core single and double action lockwork using that tip to tip trigger and hammer extension system for single action and the spring loaded hammer nose plus the same extension on the trigger for double action. He dated this invention to 1856. He also shows an overarching arm invented by Hubert Comblaine. This is the same as what would be in the Fanyu patent without the extra hammer rebound operation. And this was dated to 1859. These two inventions would basically make up a good 95% of the Fanyu design, and really the three names should be strongly associated with modern revolvers. That is, if Mueller is correct. Two problems. There's a lot of twos in this episode. Uh, one, I found a few errors in Mueller's work already. This has largely come uh, from my greater access to information in this digital age, besides the Fanyu. I've also managed to predate the Frankot hammer block about eight years sooner than he did. No biggie though, because we can always double check Mueller's work. So I asked Lars to go pluck the Marriott and Comblain patents from the archives. He just needs to find them from the suitable years that Mueller lists. He has been unable to find them, to the point that I'm now worried that they are not there. Either patent. But that's weird, because there are clearly drawings in Mueller's book. Where did they come from? Those drawings weren't actually as nice as the ones I'm showing you now. His were clearly photocopies of these examples that I took from a Dutch book compiled in 1869, written by none other than our own Johannes Jofestus Berhensius. I wouldn't have known this if we hadn't done the Dutch episode. And this leads to problem two of Mueller's work. While he's pretty detailed elsewhere in his two volume set, he does not clearly state where the Marriott and Comblain claims of, well, I assume invention date come from. He just has the dates and then the information. The, the actions uh, appear to have been attributed to them based on the writings of Berhensius in 1869, but that would be well after the claimed 1850s dates. And Berhensius' book doesn't list anything like when they were originally developed. Uh, Belgian, British, nor American patents have been forthcoming that fit these dates, nor actually these patents exactly. I've never seen references to French ones, and I don't have anyone currently available to dig the French archives. <coughs> wink, wink, nudge, nudge. So what does all this mean? Well, it means that we're actually stuck trying to pick between three options and having to do all three options. Let me point them out. A, prove out Mueller's dates. This is something that we've been currently trying to do, but unfortunately he's now deceased. So the best we can do is dig through his personal notes, which are apparently quite numerous and written in foreign, but thankfully safely stored at the Royal Armories. I've been emailing with Jonathan Ferguson on this matter and frankly bribing him with snacks, but that's gonna take time. They don't have a guy dedicated to just doing things for Othias yet, Jonathan. 
Um, and there's no sense sitting on our hands while we wait on them. So let's talk about option B. We could beat Mueller's dates, which is something we have to try to do anyway in order to make sure that his data is sound. I've already beaten his dates on at least one other thing, right? For example, Mueller did an excellent job of digging up a much earlier version of the Shamlo Delvine lockwork under the name Chanot. However, he didn't catch an earlier version of the Tranter lockwork, one that I actually very recently found under a Belgian inventor by the name of Ancien, who, by the way, again, with the help of Lars. We all only know what we know. So, can I find any earlier use of either the Comblain arm or the Marriott hammer nose than those claimed by Mueller? Because if I can, then we don't even have to worry about Mueller's dates. They're, they're not of consequence anymore. But so far, the answer to that is no. The earliest hint of the Comblain arm that I have found is what appears to be its application in this 1860 Comblain patent. However, it was not the subject of this document and is poorly depicted. However, it does keep the suggestion going that Comblain was the inventor of that rebound arm since Comblain is using it shortly thereafter the claim. As for the hammer nose double action plus trigger and hammer extension single action, the earliest sign of it for sure in a Marriott patent that we've found so far is one dated from much later in 1865. However, as far back as 1861, we can see a similarly structured revolver noticeably using only two screws in the lockwork, which heavily implies the use of only the trigger and hammer in order to create a double and single action operation. However, until I can find the supposed 1856 patent, the earliest document I have in hand is this British patent from 1858 by a separate gentleman named William Harding. It's not unusual, however, for Belgian patents to show up a few years later in Britain under a different name. Okay, I haven't proved out his point, nor have I been able to beat it. So that leaves option C, the third option. Simply discard his data, which is frankly what we will have to do in the end if we can't reinforce his dates or find his notes for where his claims came from. We'll have to take the first instances in which we can find these particular features. While the Harding patent is actually nice and firm, making that kind of easy, Combling's suggested role in an unrelated patent is a bit less comforting. And that, folks, is where I'm stuck. So just to review the core issue for anybody that got lost along the way, this Fanyu patent from 1874 is dead on the most common martial lock work we see going into the 1880s and 1890s. It's the earliest instance we know of it existing. A book published in 1869 clearly shows a similar action fitted to a pinfire revolver attributed to Hubert Comblain. The only thing missing is the rebounded hammer function. That same book says the Comblain action is a modification of the Giles Mariette system of single and double action. The problem with both of these drawings is that they represent commercially available arms, available to buy from those gunsmiths at that time, but it doesn't guarantee that they were the inventors, and 1869 is over a decade after the claimed origins of both. We only have the suggestion of the Comblain arm on a clearly different revolver in 1860. And the earliest we can prove out the single and double action uh, system that would be called, say, Mariette, is actually in Harding's 1858 British patent. But this, of course, flies in the face of a noted author who we can't actually ask questions of right now. By the way, this is also beginning to be true of the Tranter, the Shamlo, the Nagant, and other actions we've covered. They all need me to delve into a myriad of 1850s and 1860s patents. So, what did I do? Well, I took some time to modify RC and Arsenal website. I slapped on a timeline plugin and began feeding in revolver patents. This would greatly help my organization and understanding of just what happened and when. And with it available to the public like this, I could solicit some help. So, if you're intrigued by all of this, and you're a member of our free and publicly available Discord that you can join at the bottom of our website anytime you want, uh, you just scroll down and click the Discord icon, and then read the rules, for God's sake, read the rules. Uh, you too can help process in patents if you happen to have some spare time. We have plenty, I think uh, fewer than 350 have been processed of over 800 that we have identified so far. I suspect we'll eventually break 1000 though. So, while we process what we know, while we seek out more primary resources, 
while we wait on good old Jonathan. Sweet. Sweet Jonathan, who surely won't forsake us. Ahem, Jonathan. All right, gang, I want you to put on your funny hat and your big beard and, frankly, your gut and pretend that you're Matthias. You've created a number of episodes that you know have incorrect data in them. However, you don't know the correct data and you won't know it for some time. And for the most part, generally 99 out of a, well, really 99.9% .9 of all people aren't gonna know that the data's wrong. So you could just keep your mouth shut and ride with it until you figure it out and then maybe readdress it later. But that doesn't seem fair. You also have an animator who's desperately overwhelmed and you were supposed to be doing a special right now on all the pieces of the Python revolver and where they came from and exactly who invented what so that everybody could marvel at the number of people involved in the modern revolver. And then you found out you didn't know. Okay, what do you do? Well, you cut a special and you tell everybody exactly what is going on and exactly where you are in the research and you invite anybody who wants to go deeper than that to join. And then frankly, you brace for the impact for the flood of comments and probably emails from people who misheard one of the very many points in this episode that didn't actually get wrapped up because they can't be wrapped up. But I suppose I'm not really talking to them right now. I'm talking to those of you who really believe in getting the material right, who have been supporting us when we give it our best. So I'm sorry that this episode wasn't the usual, but I wanna thank you guys for sticking with us, especially our research helpers and those patrons who give us the funds to be able to take on these hard tasks in between producing documentaries every other week. I sincerely hope we can continue to meet most of your expectations. All right, have a good one, y'all. He said, yeah, I've got a new hobby. Uh, I said, oh, well, taking care of the goats. I heard you were expanding. He's like, yeah, they start doing whatever they're doing and you can follow them. I've never done that before. And I went, okay. Mm -hmm. He's like, I, found, I noticed somewhere in hour two or three, I realized what I was doing. I just started following one for a while and eventually he'd poop. And I'd sort of just check the poo. I just rolled my foot over, just looked at the condition. I just moved the next goat. I don't think I've ever been happier. <laughs> 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 I should find an event where people bring their guns to the event and issue a challenge for everybody to bring their 1911s and clearly put like a tag on it that it's theirs. Mm -hmm. And the thing locks, so that's good. But we should definitely get 80 1911s into this thing. <laughs> Thank God I was waiting for you to ask this exact question and I <laughs> whip it off and I unzip it, which is when I realized that my, my entire bag, the way it's set up at that time, mm -hmm is nothing but black boxes, wires, mm -hmm. and two white phosphorus tubes that I was keeping the batteries in. <laughs> Which is exactly where you should understand how bad of a theater security is. Mm -hmm. 